So one of the things that David and the crowd does so well is that they speak the fluent language in my heart and soul into the room. This is my This is my native my native soul tongue, the place where I can relax and just be and be present and be in my body and open up to something way way bigger than who I am. And so if you saw me at the 8.30, you're probably wondering, what in the world is she doing over there? But just because I can speak atheist doesn't mean I can't get my Pentecostal on. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm. And this is where I'm comfortable, you need to know. This is where I am comfortable in worship, is in this space. And it's interesting because, see, the 8.30 and the 10 also speak to my heart, so don't get, me, don't get me wrong. But this is where I feel like I can bring my voice, my singing voice with me along for the ride. And it, there's room for that jazzy back and forth. That happens in other services too, but this is the place where I feel the most comfortable doing that is in this space. So this has been fun all day. How many of you, will you stand up if you've been with us since 8.30? Woo! Look at that. Thank you. Thank you. I have to just admit one little thing, though, very much on the same note of, of, uh, of being in my native tongue here, is that my favorite part of this morning was praying with uh, Eric Banner, our intern minister, before the 8.30 service. So before the 8.30 service, Eric and I, in my office, prayed for me to find the right words to argue a case against God. (laughs) My God is big enough to hold all that. All that. All that. And as I was listening to them sing, I thought, you know, the glory of that is that when, when you can crack open that tiny God and let him go, the words to those kinds of songs about surrendering yourself to this largest, biggest, most amazing, incredible God that can also deal with, handle suffering, that can remind you of the light in the midst of the darkness, it is just incredible. Yes. Incredible. Well, if you were with us this morning, which many of you were, you heard me at the humanist service make an argument against God. I went even so far as to describe myself as an atheist in one sense of the word. Now, for those of you who may have seen me quite authentically basking in the spirit, you might be stumped about the term atheist, but hold on. What that means in the Greek is a theos without gods, right? Which was derogatorily applied to anyone who did not believe in the accepted gods of the culture. This included those who believed in false gods, no gods, or simply doctrines that stood in conflict with the established religions of the time. These were the folks who resisted the interpretation of the dominant religion, who refused to follow the status quo, and they are our ancestors. In fact, early Christians and the forefathers and foremothers of this free faith, both the universalist and the Unitarian sides of our family tree, would have been considered atheists under that definition as they boldly proclaimed that God was one. They stood in opposition to the polytheism of the time. So we have inherited this faith from atheists and from heretics. Heretics from heretikus, from the Greek, heretikus, the ability to choose. The ability to choose, to make a choice. God gave us the power and the will to choose. And when we don't, we are doing him a huge disservice. And the world a disservice. And ourselves a disservice. We have to be awake even in our choice about God. Aren't we fortunate atheists and heretic family members? And I mean that. Aren't we fortunate that we live in a time and a place where we can make choices about our religious identities? And we can make choices right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in this church on a Sunday morning about what liturgical style moves us closer to our truest selves, 
connects us to something bigger than ourselves, be it a humanist language or a traditional Unitarian language or this service, a universalist Pentecostal service. We can make choices about what language speaks to our hearts and our minds when we come on Sunday morning to be in community and reflect on our values. Being able to choose one's religious affiliation is a modern concept. It has only been true through recent history, and I know that I am closer to God. My definition of God has been blown. The boxes, the sides are just blown off the box, right? I am closer to the holy because I can choose. Now, the term atheist applied to those who denied the local gods even if they believed in other gods. So Karen Armstrong reminds us that during the 16th and the 17th centuries, all the way up to the 17th century, nobody would have dreamed of calling themselves an atheist. In the middle of the 17th century, it was still assumed that it was impossible not to believe in God. Impossible. People who didn't believe in God were just in denial. And so atheist meant not accepting the current conception of the divine. Well, I don't accept the current conception of the divine. Don't know about you, but it's bigger than most people will define for me. So in a sense, if we believe that the majority of Americans or even simply the majority of Oklahomans believe in a condemning or a fundamentalist God of separation of a particular Christian persuasion, then by definition, rejecting that God would make everyone in this church an atheist regardless of what service you attend. So you can call me an atheist too. If it means I don't believe in a God who causes natural disasters... You can call me an atheist, too, if it means I don't believe in a hateful, disdainful, meddling God like Mike Huckabee, who believed that God didn't save the children of Sandy Hook Elementary on Friday because he wasn't invited there due to a lack of prayer in schools. How about that? I can't worship that God. You can call me an atheist, too, if it means I don't believe in a God that will only bless those who say certain words, pray particular prayers, read certain books, or repeat specific creeds like some kind of magical word against the evils in this world. Now, in his book, Good Without God, Harvard's humanist chaplain, Greg Epstein, makes a distinction that I think is really important, and Marlon and I have both already talked about it this morning, but I just want to bring it to those of you who haven't seen us. So many smart people still think that the conversation about what is true and meaningful and worthwhile in life begins with the question, do you believe in God? But do you believe in God is actually a pretty meaningless question. The real question all people, whether secular or religious, ought to be asking themselves and one another is what do you believe about God? Because just like Marlon argued in the second service, God is. God is for 87% of the population. So let's just talk about what we mean when we say the word. Now, in order to understand what anyone means when they call themselves an atheist or a humanist or a theist or an agnostic or a Christian in this church, you're going to have to stay in relationship with them long enough to find out about the God in which they do or do not believe. So Marlon and I actually agree on many of the big points. And whether or not you call us atheist or theist, we would want to be in dialogue about what that means to you. And that, my friends, is why God matters. Because as Marlon already said, God and religion should be doorways to understanding, not walls. Because religion, the religion that binds me, the religion that speaks to my heart, this free religious faith that allows us to all live under the same roof and worship in three completely different ways, demands that we stay in relationship with difference. It demands that we stay in relationship with difference. That diversity is purposeful and beautiful. And when we are in relationship with diversity, we are called to be our highest selves. So our religion demands that we not isolate ourselves from the world, lest we come up with crazy ideas like Mr. Huckabee's. Our religion demands that we look through a lens that we don't ordinarily see through. 
That if we limit our understanding to God having revealed himself to one particular group of people at one particular point in history, we are limiting ourselves to a very stingy God. God and our definition of God must grow with us and meet this ever-changing world. This free faith is a religion that makes us take the broad, the broad view and the deep view of God and this world. Do you see what I mean? Broad and deep. Broad and deep. God's love, as I understand it, includes everyone. The Muslim and the Christian and the Jew, the agnostic and the humanist and the Buddhist and the Hindu and the atheist, both sides of a football game, both sides of a war, the victim and the perpetrator, the prosecution and the defense, death and life beauty and suffering, the significance of our individual lives and the value of all life on this earth. All those Sandy Hook Elementary students and adults whose lives were taken that day and Adam Lanza. All of those who were massacred on Friday and Adam Lanza. This perspective of God being this large, the largest system possible. For you humanists, just like go to systems theory and expand to the largest system possible. Requires me, when I stay in relationship with it, to push my compassion to the limit. This relationship with a God symbolizing that largest system is a symbol of the complexity that contains all that is. This understanding of God is including the perspectives of each and every being who has ever graced this earth or whoever will. So past and present and future. It forces me to look realistically and practically at a very complicated world that contains incredible suffering, incredible violence, as well as immeasurable beauty and cooperation, and compassion, and love. And this religion, because we are doing this work of trying to understand God together, connects me to diversity and complexity and community that can remind me of the beauty when all that is in front of me is pain. We are a church because we are all not in the same place at the same time. We can feed one another, remind one another about the beauty in this world when suffering is at our doorstep. Because we are bound by covenant in our diversity doing this work together, just by being in relationship in this way, I am strengthened. And it tips the scale. It's like putting a, you know, if you've got diversity, if you've got uh, suffering and pain and tragedy on one end of the scale and beauty and love and compassion on the other, it just puts one little finger on this love-compassion scale, right? So that I might feel gratitude and humility and know that other people have made it through difficult times and know that The God of my understanding is a God that would understand my suffering. This community holds us accountable to consider our choices with the layers of both self and community, even pushing us to make choices based on how they might affect generations to come. So you can call that atheism or humanism or theism. You can use the word God or Jesus or Christ There are those in this church who relate to Jesus as that symbol of ultimate compassion, of that largest concern. The connection between past and present and future of self and community. Some might call it Buddha or Allah or Yahweh. Whatever you call it, I don't care. It's a word. And so the great thing about it is that in the context of this church, we can allow people to fully develop their relationship with whatever they want to call it. And because 
This Jesus story is in my cultural history, and I have allowed Jesus to grow with me, letting him out of the box. I now have a bigger understanding of Jesus as a symbol of this largest system. And see, the great thing about Jesus is that his story contains within it so much of the allegory of the human experience. And at the same time, he calls us to go beyond the status quo. If it is true that religion has caused so much pain and so much suffering in this world, in addition to the beauty and the lives that it has changed, and it is true, I mentioned in the 830 that the case against religion may in fact even be easier than the case against God. In the 20th century alone, around the globe, 809 million people died in the name of religion. The 20th century alone. So if you compare that with 209 million people who died in the name of communism and 62 million who died during World War II, you can conclude that more people died in the name of religion in the 20th century than in the name of communism or Hitler, or the two combined times two. 809 million people. So why on earth could I possibly want to be religious, you might ask? I'm going to say it, and I may have to say it four times, but I'm going to say it. Because if the problem is a religious one, then the solution is a religious one as well. If the problem systematically is a religious problem, then the answer needs to be a religious solution. Are you with me? Wars were fought in the name of God because their God was too small. One group could not include the other in their definition of God. That kind of either-or mentality causes people to defend themselves in order to preserve their own identity. We need another way. This church offers another way. And if we want to change that kind of small-minded religion, that kind of small God religion, If we want to make a difference in how religion is used and how God is evoked, we have to expand the definition of God to include the increasing complexity and diversity of this world so that God is relevant to people's lives. We have to reclaim religious language, to use God language in order to be in the conversation with those who have done, who have done, and who have the potential to do the most damage across time and history. We have to learn to speak God fluently. Are you with me? Are you with me? We have to learn to speak God fluently and own your definition. And so in order to stay relevant to ourselves, we have to be impacted by the widest lens of humanity. Or if you prefer, we have to be impacted by all of God's children. So in our church, we have to also, if your tendency or your native tongue is this service, then you also might want to stretch and learn to speak a little atheist and agnostic or humanist so that we can all get our point across. When we come together with this broadest possible definition of God that can unite us, sustain us, grow with us. Our voices can respond to the ways in which religion is wielded to separate and ostracize and denigrate. Are you with me? And so now, if you were here with me from the 8.30 or the 10 10 o'clock, like, I don't know if you know this, but we have one young man who actually drove in all the way from Bentonville, Arkansas to be with us this morning. Most of, most of this sermon so far has been in the native tongue of our humanist and more traditional theist Unitarian service. And so for you 8.30 and 10 o'clock people, if you'll just excuse me, I need to talk to my 11.30 folk because you're in their home. So in the midst of the darkest season, I want to remind you this morning not only of a hope that is being born into this world but also of something absolutely incredible. I want to remind you of something incredible that happened, but it happened on Pentecost. You see, up until this point for the Christian Christian scriptures, everyone was convinced that what God wanted was to scatter the people to the four corners of the earth to keep them out of trouble. They were arrogant, you see. 
Early in the Hebrew scriptures, if you remember in Genesis chapter 11, for those of you who have your Bibles, or your Bible app, In Genesis chapter 11, the whole world had a single common speech and Yahweh discovers them building this tower way up into the heavens so that they can make a name for themselves. And Yahweh says in Genesis chapter 6, if as one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. So come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. Now for you folk and others interested, there are actually many creation stories across the globe with similar themes. Whether or not we will all actually once had a common language or not, these many stories across cultures explain something that resonates with our experience, something that is, we are all interconnected regardless of culture or language. Something, Something in our deep part of our soul knows that we are connected, but we are divided. And in this country, we are divided in the state, we are divided in the city, we are divided. We have different experiences in our family, different understandings of how we've come to this place, different meanings that we make about what our purpose is in life, and no single person can completely understand what it means to be somebody else. We cannot occupy their history, their experience, their place in space and time. And yet there is something very beautiful about our diversity like many facets of a carefully cut diamond, we all reflect the light in our very own way. But the great thing about the Abrahamic faiths is that the story does not end with the Tower of Babel. The story, the Tower of Babel, is one of three stories that are closely woven together, Babel and Moses and the Pentecost. First, God separates us as a people because we are full of pride, and maybe he was too just saying. God has to grow with us now, right? And we learn to stay separated by joining with those who were like us and resisting those who were not. And from our separation, there were wars and genocides and isms, racism and sexism and terrorism and all of this is actually just our pride taking over again, right? We are divided interpersonally as well with the development of language and culture came writing and education and our experience of the world began to be recorded and divided. At least in Western culture's history, we began to hierarchically judge our experience of the world, placing experience that could be classified and cataloged and proven above the experiences of the heart and the spirit, revelation and intuition, epistemology, as Marlon referred to at the 10 o'clock. And then, see, after Babel, and then was Acts 2. See, in the Christian scriptures in Acts 2, something happens. The story changes. On the Jewish festival day of Shavuot, celebrated long before Jesus came, on that day that celebrates God giving to Moses the Ten Commandments, everyone hearing this story in Acts at the time would know that even if we miss it when we're reading it today. On the very day commemorating when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, something very strange happened to a group of Jesus' followers on Pentecost. You see, I believe on that day God changed his mind. God grew with us. God chose differently. You see, on Pentecost, a gathering of people from all over. See, he scattered us initially, right? We went all over and developed different cultures, so it says. And then we gathered in one place because there was a road where they were doing lots of trade. And so there were people there with lots of cultures, right? All in the same place, speaking all kinds of different languages, and nobody could understand one another. And then the wind began to blow. Now, in the Bible, when the wind begins to blow, you pay attention. It means wake up, something very important is about to happen. The wind began to blow and the people saw what seemed to be tongues of fire reaching down to them and the fire separated and came to rest on each of them. And when I think of this story, I imagine it coming straight to their heart. And the Galileans began to speak. Now I'm sure since they were practical people, the first thing that they were telling one another was, hey man, you're on fire. (laughs) 
And the passers-by in the street, all they could hear was, but the people in the room, the people in the room heard their own language coming from foreigners. God must have decided that even in our difference with God's help, we were called to seek to understand one another, to use the language that other people will understand in order to be understood. It was a miracle. People with very different backgrounds, with different cultures and different understandings were all under the same roof, declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues. Can you imagine it? Oh, wait, it's happening here. Let me try it again. People, it was a miracle. People with very different backgrounds, with very different cultures and different understandings were all under the same roof declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues. Sound familiar? Yes. Everyone understood. So what do we take away from this story? God separates us in Genesis, and then by the miracle of miracles, we have an opportunity to be together in the same room, speaking in our own tongues about the wonder of God, and we're heard. I want to tell you a story, a little diversion here, about an atheist who was struck by the Spirit. Yours truly. When I was 16 years old, I went to Paris for the first time. I was an atheist at this point in my life. I had been kicked out of a black Baptist church for not being black. It's true. I can tell you that story some other time. I was kicked out of a white Baptist church for dancing after I was baptized fully immersed. That's a good story, too. We'll save that for another time. And I had given up on the Methodists who tired of my questions and made me re repeat some kind of creed that I didn't, I didn't believe. But my religion at the time when I went to Paris was academia. And my educated lens at 16 was emphasizing finger on the scale those 809 million people who were dead in religious wars in this century, in addition to the millions since recorded history had begun. And so I walked into Notre Dame Cathedral for the very first time, and there was this choir singing in Latin, beautiful. And the sound bounced all around the stone walls, and the smell of incense was strong, and it was dark with candles burning in every enclave, lighting up these beautiful stained glass windows. And I remember looking at the choir and hearing them and looking at the tall stone ceiling with these rafters that make you feel tiny, made to draw the eye up so that the structure feels enormous. And I remember looking at the floor and seeing the names of people, the names of saints who were buried underneath my feet as I walked across the floor. And I remember thinking, who in the world do we think we are deciding who is saintly and who is not? Who do we think we are? And then I fainted. I mean, right onto the floor. I never fainted before. I have never fainted since. But in that moment, I felt like I had been whisked through history from the creation of the world in this beautiful starlit explosion all the way to the present day, as though I was seeing it unfold through God's eyes, through God's perspective. I saw the cathedral that I was standing in built on the backs of the lower classes. I saw kings and queens lifted up and worshiped instead of God. I saw people separated by religion, centuries of wars fought in the name of God, and I felt this overwhelming sense of sadness and confusion and mostly just disappointment. We weren't getting it. Humanity was just not getting it. And then I woke up. Now that experience, for whatever reason, did not make me feel particularly special, like I was on some mission and needed to go heal people. I didn't think I was given any insider information, frankly. It did help me open my heart to believe that God could exist beyond any creed. I already believed that the variety of religious expressions were reflections of our culture. And all those gods were too small for me. What I hadn't considered until then was the possibility of there being a God big enough to transcend all of that. So when I fainted, the lid flew off the box. 
Unitarians and Pentecostals agree on a few things. We agree that the revelation of God was not only at one time for one specific group of people. It is available to us today. The miracle of God's creation is all around us. The beauty of this story in Acts for me is that this miracle was not about speaking gibberish. It was about speaking in a language to those different from you that can be understood. Right? The miracle was that those present heard their own language being spoken by foreigners. The miracle was just as much about the listening as it was about the speaking. The miracle was that even in their conflicting cultures and languages, even in their contradictions, when they spoke from their heart, filled with spirit, they were including the foreigner. They were understood. And the differences were not washed away. The differences remained and even added flavor to the conversation. The miracle was also connected to the law being handed down to Moses. The laws of Moses are for us to grapple with along with our experience of the Spirit. And the Bible is there for us to grapple with too in its richness and in its contradictions. So placing it on this day says to me, we all have contradictions. Pay attention to your spirit and the law. Pay attention to your spirit and the law. What do we do when the law and our experience is in contradiction? How do we practice that coexistence of difference? How do we honor our own experience and the experience of others with healthy boundaries that honor who we are and our personal experience and our hearts open to one another and to change? The first way is to come to church, to bind yourself to a religious community that recognizes and celebrates difference. Because what happened on that day of Pentecost is still happening, maybe even more so here. Because we recognize that the miracle is in the speaking and the listening. The container is even bigger here. The miracle is in the meaning that can be conveyed in the translation and extends well beyond it. The miracle is our coexisting together. So what do we do when the law and our experience is in contradiction? How do we practice coexistence in our difference? How do we honor our experience and the experience of others with our hearts open? What do we do, theist or humanist or atheist? How do we stay in relationship? Well, for this service, I would say we pray. We keep trying and we keep letting God grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And we pray. We stay connected to those around us. And we pray. With the wonder of God and the wonders of our existence, we can look realistically at the suffering in this world and still have faith and hope. And let everyone who shows up in this church represent to us that we can make it through whatever the suffering is. We pray like the rabbis in the concentration camp who tried God and found him to be guilty of hostility and cruelty and indifference. And then they prayed. I pray for you. You pray for me. We're all a part of God's body. I won't harm you. With words from my mouth, I love you, I need you to survive. Can we sing that, David? Will you join me? You pray. 